Having a Rolls-Royce car is like having gold bars, diamonds, or a Birkin. Since its establishment in 1884, this brand has stayed relevant for centuries. But did you know that the founder of the Rolls-Royce brand was a poor young boy who sold newspapers at nine years old? Part 1. Frederick Henry Royce Frederick Henry Royce was born on the 27th of March, 1863. His parents, James and Mary Royce, raised him and his four older siblings near Peterborough. To survive, his father ran a flour mill that was under the Church of England's ecclesial commissioners. The commissioners ran small businesses to distribute the revenues they made from the church. After much effort to keep the business running, the flour mill business failed, and the Royce family moved to London. They had to survive with whatever funds came by, not knowing the tragedy that would hit them. In 1872, when Frederick Royce was only nine years old, his father, the breadwinner of the family, suddenly died. The family now had no money to get their daily necessities, so it got really difficult to survive. Even though he was the youngest child, Frederick Royce had to sell newspapers and deliver telegrams whenever he wasn't in school to help his mother provide for his siblings. Years later, his aunt found out about their family's living conditions and gave him some financial help. He used the funds to get an apprenticeship with the Great Northern Railway Company in 1878, but the money only lasted for a small three years. Once again, he was broke and back to where he was years before. Frederick did not give up. He sought employment and worked for a tool-making company in Leeds, but even that wasn't enough for him. He quit working for the tool company and returned to London to join the Electric Light and Power Company. In 1882, he was posted to their office in Liverpool. During his time there, he worked on street and theater lighting. Two years later, his friend Ernest Claremont proposed a business partnership of making domestic electrical in Manchester, but Frederick only had 20 pounds saved up. Ernest Claremont contributed 50 pounds and with the combined 70 pounds, they started a company called F. H. Royce. By 1894, the business had grown immensely. Their company started producing dynamos and electric cranes, and they were registered as a limited liability company. Frederick Royce intended to spend the rest of his life working as an engineer, since it was something he was very good at. However, after the Second Boer War, his company's trade dropped. The market for dynamos and electric cranes, which was a major source of revenue in his company, became even more competitive with products coming from Germany and the United States of America. Frederick Royce had to find new ways for his company to survive. In 1894, Royce re-registered F.H. Royce as Royce Limited to prepare for what was to come. He explored many options that could keep his engineering career alive and save the company, but he could find nothing until he purchased second-hand two-cylinder French Decaville. This car fascinated Frederick so much so that he spent the next few years figuring out how it worked inside out. In his explorations, he found several errors and decided to design and build something better. Frederick spent so much time on making a better engine that he neglected himself and even fell ill in 1902. However, this did not stop him from exploring engines. By 1903, Frederick had designed and built his first petrol engine. He worked even harder to build a car that was better than his own two-cylinder French Ducaville. Regardless of all his troubles, he never gave up and finally succeeded. He hit his first breakthrough with the petrol engine. In 1904, Frederick drove the first Rolls-Royce 10-horsepower car into town. Changing his company name and learning how to make a better car wasn't the only thing that led to the birth of Rolls-Royce. As the name suggests, there was someone else who needed to succeed just as much. Part 2. Charles Stuart Rolls Unlike Frederick, Charles Rolls was royalty from birth, so he never had money problems. Charles Rolls was born in London on the 27th of August, 1877, as the third son of his parents, John Rolls, the first Baron of Langatic, and Georgina Rolls, the Lady Langatic. Although he was born in London, 
he kept strong ties to his ancestral home in Wales. His father prioritized the education of his children and sought extra lessons for them. For this reason, Charles was sent to Mortimer Vicarage Preparatory School in Berkshire to prepare for college. He later continued his education at Eton College in Berkshire, where he studied until 1894. At Elton College, Charles developed a strange interest in engines, which was odd among his rich peers. He explored engines during his free time and often had his sleeves covered in grease. His peers did not miss the chance to make fun of him for it. He was nicknamed Dirty Rolls or Petrols, but his fascination with engines never stopped. In 1894, he was enrolled in a private cram school, which helped him get admitted to study mechanical and applied sciences at Trinity College, Cambridge, a year later. In 1896, Charles Roll's fascination with engines led him to Paris, where he bought his first car, a Peugeot Fantion, and he was just 18 years old when he purchased it. This Peugeot is even believed to be the very first car in Cambridge at that time, and is the third car in Wales ever. After buying his first car, Charles joined the Automobile Club of France, and that pushed him one step closer to meeting Frederick Royce. Charles and the other car owners were restricted by the Third Locomotive Act set in 1878, so he could not use his car as he pleased. For this reason, he joined the Self-Propelled Traffic Association and their campaigns against the Locomotive Act. This law placed restrictions and regulated the use of mechanically operated vehicles on British highways. Charles Royce's activism led him to become one of the founding members of the Automobile Club of Great Britain. And not long after, he took an interest in cycling as well. Funny enough, he spent the rest of his time at Cambridge doing bicycle races, and even won one in 1896. The following year, Charles Rolls became the captain of the Cambridge University Bicycle Club. But college life must eventually come to an end. In 1898, Charles graduated from Cambridge University and immediately started work on a steam yacht called Santa Maria. Following his first job, Charles started working more in the engineering field, but he soon realized that he was better at making new things and selling them than just being an engineer. After graduating from university, he was still racing, but this time with his car. In 1903, he broke a speed record in Dublin, but it was not acknowledged because of his timing equipment. He needed funding for his race and even reached out to his father for financial help. John Rolls gave his son £6,600 to start any business of its choice. With this capital, he reached out to his friend, Claude Johnson, and together they founded a company that imports and sells Peugeot Motors from France and Minerva called CS Rolls & Company. Part 3. The Friendship That Changed the Game So far, the lives of Frederick Royce and Charles Rolls appear to be two sides of a coin. They both live in the same country, but experienced very different parts of it. Frederick had to struggle for everything, whilst Charles had the freedom of possibilities thanks to his father's wealth. The birth of Rolls Royce came when these two joined their experiences together. But how did the two meet? By 1904, both Frederick and Charles were already in the car business. Frederick was in the business of making them, and Charles was in the business of buying and selling them. Even though they were in the same industry, they didn't know they needed each other until Henry Edmund bragged about his new Royce 10 horsepower to Charles Rolls. Henry was a shareholder in Royce Limited, and he was a friend of Charles, who was in the business of selling cars. While Frederick worked on designing, building, and improving cars, business was going well for Charles. But he had one problem. He could only sell imported cars, and he complained to his friend Henry about his problem around the time he bragged about his Royce 10 horsepower. Henry decided to set up a meeting between Frederick and Charles, not knowing this meeting would change the automobile industry forever. On the 4th of May, 1904, the first meeting between Frederick and Charles happened in Manchester. The minute Charles saw Frederick's twin-cylinder 10 horsepower, he was certain he had found a solution to his problem. Charles drove the car himself and enjoyed the experience. After the drive, he immediately agreed to sell as many cars as Frederick could make, and of course, they both happily agreed to the partnership. However, 
Like every other product, giving a name is not all it takes for your products to be loved by many. Part 4. The Rolls-Royce Brand The partnership between Charles Rolls and Frederick Royce brought forth the name Rolls-Royce, but creating a brand that would last for ages was a tedious job for just Frederick and Charles. Charles set up a factory for Frederick in Derby. While Frederick was tasked with designing and making the cars, Charles's job was to sell the cars, and this proved to be very difficult in the beginning stage. Charles had to deal with a big problem. He miscalculated when he sorted a local branch of cars to sell as he realized that no one would buy cars from a brand that wasn't famous and all the famous brands at the time were foreign. They needed to build value on the brand and make sure everyone in Great Britain knew of the existence of Rolls-Royce. Luckily, there was one perfect man for the job. Charles Rolls brought in his business partner and friend, Claude Johnson to act in the position of managing director for Rolls-Royce. While Charles Rolls was a skilled salesperson, Claude Johnson was excellent at publicity. With him as managing director, he helped improve the reputation of the brand, and thus, slowly, more people started to buy Rolls-Royce cars. Claude Johnson started several advertisement campaigns to promote the brand. Two years after the Rolls-Royce partnership, Frederick successfully built a car with a six-cylinder engine, the Silver Ghost, which would soon become one of the best-known cars. Claude used this new achievement to advertise Rolls-Royce as the best car in the world. This phase is still associated with the Rolls-Royce brand to date. Even though the name of the car didn't have Claude's name, there was no denying his contribution to the Rolls-Royce brand. However, people often regarded him as the hyphen that keeps the Rolls and Royce together. In 1910, business was going smoothly. Frederick worked harder and harder because he craved perfection, completely ignoring the fact that he had fallen ill because of his hard work eight years ago. Fortunately, his illness didn't return as many had expected, only until something tragic happened. When Charles wasn't on salesman duty, he enjoyed racing with his cars, but he also enjoyed flying as well. Charles took interest in flying in 1907, and after he failed to persuade Frederick to make aero engines, he bought a Wright Flyer, one of the earliest aircraft to be produced by the Wright brothers in the United States of America. Their aircraft was developed around the time of the Rolls-Royce partnership. On the 12th of July 1910, Charles took a flight in his Wright Flyer, but the plane encountered an accident mid-air, which led to his death. Charles Rolls became the first Briton to die in an aeronautical accident. The death of Charles Rolls affected the company greatly. Claude and Frederick lost their good friend and business partner. Claude, who understudied Charles while he was alive, took over his salesman job beside his promotion job. In 1911, a few months after Charles died, Frederick fell ill again, and this time it was more serious. He had no choice but to leave Derby for London to treat his illnesses in 1912. Frederick had a major surgery done in London, and the doctors told him he had only a few months to live. Frederick is known to be controlled by perfectionism, and against the doctor's instructions, he stubbornly returned to Derby, insisting on checking the new designs of engineers himself. However, he was not allowed to visit the factory, which had moved to another location while he was in London. Meanwhile, Claude was running the Rolls-Royce company in the absence of both Charles and Frederick, but he wasn't doing it on his own. After Frederick fell sick in 1902, minor illnesses constantly threatened his health, and he feared he would die before they accomplished anything big. So in 1908, Frederick rigorously drew out plans for the future of Rolls-Royce. According to his visionary plan, the company would have a larger factory at a different location by 1912, Claude used this as an opportunity to keep Frederick away so he could recover and return stronger. Unfortunately, he was never able to return to the factory because of his bad health. But he bought a villa in southern France and a house in Crowborough, East Sussex. While traveling back from France to East Sussex, the First World War broke out in July 1914. Part 5. Rolls-Royce Aerospace 
When the First World War started in 1914, Rolls-Royce was taken by surprise, because their company focused on producing luxury cars. With a war of this scale, the military would need aero engines, and Rolls-Royce never produced aero engines. The company became vulnerable, and Claude Johnson, who was managing the company, was afraid the bank would withdraw its overdraft facility that Rolls-Royce depended on. Frederick Royce never liked the idea of designing an aero engine. Charles had tried to convince him to design aero engines while he was alive, but Frederick's refusal never ended. Claude and the other directors at Rolls-Royce decided not to follow the trend of producing aero engines. They expected that the war would not last for a long time and went on with plans for making more luxury cars. However, they were gravely mistaken. The decision to stay away from producing aero engines changed when the war office persuaded Rolls-Royce to manufacture 50 air-cooled V8 engines. While the air-cooled V8 engine was still in production, the Royal Aircraft Factory asked for new 200-horsepower engines. Rolls-Royce eventually agreed to overturn their decision, and they began the production of aero engines. But aero engine production was a new field for them which they had to do while also producing cars. So they struggled to manufacture the aero engine according to the quantities and time frame given by the war office. Having Frederick around would have been a big help, but he was still very sick and was not allowed to come to the factory. However, he continued to design engines from his home and sent them to the factory to be produced. In 1915, Rolls-Royce successfully developed its first aero engine, which was the 12-cylinder Eagle. Two years later, Frederick moved to a village called West Wittering in West Sussex. After the creation of the first aero engine, Rolls-Royce made other designs, and Claude named them after the Birds of Prey. There was the smaller six-cylinder Hawk, the 190 horsepower or 140 kilowatt Falcon, and a larger 675 horsepower or 503 kilowatt Condor, which was produced before the war ended in 1918. The shortage of delivery during the First World War helped Claude understand they needed to expand again, but he feared licensing production of the aero engines to other manufacturers would put the quantity of their product at risk. However, he used the Derby factory as an extension to increase the production rate. Production of aero engines made up a majority of Rolls-Royce by the late 20s, and business was booming. However, another sudden death happened in the company, and it wasn't Frederick Royce who was predicted to pass on years ago. On the 26th of April, 1926, Claude Johnson died. Rolls-Royce remained in the care of other company executives after Claude's death. They continued production of the aero engines, but the six-cylinder car, nicknamed the Silver Ghost, was still in production at the time Claude died. Frederick Royce stopped pushing to return to the factory. In October 1928, he picked a few of his top engineers and worked on a new engine called the R engine. They worked on the beach by his home in West Wittering, but they were able to create a formidable engine. In less than a year, the R engine set a record for air Soren at 357.7 miles per hour. The engine won the Schneider Trophy of 1929, but it was denied funding for production by Ramsay MacDonald, who was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the time. Frederick continued designing engines at home until his death in 1933. In 1935, Frederick's last design, the Merlin Aero engine, was flown in prototype form for the first time. You would expect that now all the funding members of the Rolls-Royce partnership were dead, the company would be over as well. But the brand was here to stay. Part 6. New Ownership Rolls-Royce remained a corporate entity under the management of its directors, but the company couldn't stay on its own. After several decades, the company couldn't meet up its financial obligations, and in 1971, the executive put Rolls-Royce up for liquidation, and it remains so to date. The assets owned by the company were immediately bought by the government and registered under the company name Rolls-Royce Limited. Although a majority of Rolls-Royce production came from aero engines, the government separated Rolls-Royce Motors from the company, and it returned to the stock market under the government of Margaret Thatcher. The ownership of Rolls-Royce continued to change to different subsidiaries over the years. 
In 2003, Rolls-Royce PLC was handed over to the Rolls-Royce Group, but it was handed down again to Rolls-Royce Holdings in 2011. However, Rolls-Royce PLC stayed as the principal company while Rolls-Royce Motors remained separated. The different subsidiaries of Rolls-Royce caused a lot of confusion, which is why on the 14th of June 2018, the company announced that they were restructuring the business. Rolls-Royce was divided into three units – civil aerospace, defense, and power systems. This decision helped the company save up to 400 million pounds per year as of 2020, while the cost of restructuring was 500 million euro. Even with the new division, Rolls-Royce continued production of aero engines and produced gas turbine engines for commercial use for military and corporate aircraft. But in the United States, they make air engines for both corporate jets, helicopters, and turbo aircraft. Rolls-Royce is now a known name in the aerospace business. They are currently the second largest producer of aero engines in the world. The first factory in Derby was still operating, and Rolls-Royce had about 15,700 employees, while 10,300 worked in other factories. However, their decision to reduce the subsidiaries of the company into just three units caused thousands of people to lose their jobs. 3,000 people in the UK alone lost their jobs. The company hoped that the production rate would make up for the staff that they had lost from trying to restructure the company. Dear hopes were caught short when the global pandemic hit in 2019-2020, causing them to lose even more of their labor force. Presently, as of September 2022, Rolls-Royce Holdings' net worth is $1.77 billion. While the holding company is famous in aerospace, most people think about Rolls-Royce Motors when they hear the brand's name. Rolls-Royce Motors produce 5,152 every year. Thanks to the entertainment industry, the car's popularity continues to grow, especially in the hip-hop industry. According to statistics, the top 20 songs on the Billboard Hot 100 from 2014 to 2017 mentioned Rolls-Royce more times than any other luxury car brand. The Rolls-Royce brand remains popular after over a century. Have you tried to purchase a Rolls-Royce luxury car? Do you know any celebrities that own one? Comment below and like this video, and check out the other on our channel.